Afghan peace talks resume this week in Doha, where representatives from the Afghan government and the Taliban will discuss, among other pressing issues, a de-escalation in violence. Among the negotiators are four Afghan women working to ensure that democratic institutions and the hard-won rights of Afghan women are preserved in any settlement. Fauzia Kufi is one of those women, and for her it's personal. The Taliban imprisoned her late husband and tried to kill her at least once. Kufi has been at the table with Taliban representatives since September 2020. She joins us now from Doha. Fauzia, welcome, and thank you for taking the time to speak with us today. Thank you for having me. So the U.S. military has begun a phased withdrawal from Afghanistan. You have called this a moral defeat which could jeopardize talks with the Taliban. Are meaningful negotiations still possible when the Taliban has been handed such a concession? It has made the negotiations uh, much more difficult, of course, uh, because I think now the preferred strategy uh, is, at least by Taliban, is a military strategy. Uh, while we still have another four, uh, few months before the complete withdrawal, uh, I believe the, the few months could be used um, uh, if we, um, uh, uh, as the government of Afghanistan and our allies, especially the United States and the region, could use their leverage, political leverage, to um, you know, bring Taliban to a meaningful and result-based negotiation. So the few months ahead of us are extremely important. We can either make these negotiations succeed, or the country once again could uh, you know, experience uh, another chaos and war. But do you feel that the Afghan government's negotiating team has lost uh, leverage at the table? Well, I think uh, the, uh, the leverage already was with Taliban when um, the United States uh, started negotiating with them, uh, which led to uh, signing the Doha Agreement in February 2020, um, on the basis of which um, the United States uh, you know, committed itself to withdraw uh, their troops um, by 1st May 2021 on basis of conditions. Uh, and there were three conditions. One was, of course, for the Taliban to meaningfully engage in uh, the negotiation, which will lead to a political settlement, uh, which uh, is inclusive, uh, with inclusion of Taliban and the rest of political community in Afghanistan and the government, of course, women uh, being there. Uh, and also the link with, uh, you know, uh, Al-Qaeda and other military extremist groups. Um, promise or commit itself that uh, Afghanistan will not be used once again by these uh, military extremist groups. Now, to see that the, the withdrawal is uh, without any conditions, of course, the leverage is already not with the government uh, negotiating team. But what I am saying here is that given the only 25 years back experience of Afghanistan, when, when Afghanistan was abandoned by international community, uh, uh, it actually paved the way for um, the, the growth of military extremist groups like Taliban and Afghanistan soil were used um, against the international uh, security and, and the 11th September attack happened. So for the sake of the world security, uh, uh, what I'm saying is that um, uh, the, the, the political leverage uh, and the diplomatic leverage could be used by the region, um, I know that uh, Turkey, for instance, being in the room can change the status quo. Uh, the neighboring countries, Pakistan, um, you know, the region, they all, uh, the Qatar, they all can play a role um, uh, to uh, end this war through a negotiated settlement. Of course, that's what we have been trying to do in the past a year or so. Um, and I personally, in the past three years, because there has already been enormous level of life lost in Afghanistan. Now, do you see any negotiated settlement other than a formal joint government-Taliban power-sharing agreement? Um, we, we need to... Uh, what we expect uh, from the other side of the negotiation table is to, um, to define their position and their uh, definition of a power-sharing agreement. Well, it when it comes to us, um, the negotiation team from Afghanistan or on behalf of the Republic of Afghanistan, we do not have any limitations when it comes to 
you know, how will a political settlement look like, except that the common principal values of people, like elections, people's participation in power, civic liberties and rights, freedom of speech, all of these common freedom, um, uh, above all, of course, women's rights, all of these common principles should be protected. Uh, above this, we do not have really any limitations. It's the Taliban who have been saying they want an Islamic structure. So what we expect the Taliban to now come forward and explain to us what is their definition of that political um, you know, Islamic structure. Uh, based on that, we can then you know, uh, see how much we can go forward in terms of a power sharing agreement. What I'm hoping is that um, a power sharing agreement will not put uh, the uh, civic liberties and the people's participation into the, to their future government in risk. There has been criticism leveled against the Afghan government regarding a disconnect between the negotiators and the Afghan public. How would you respond to this criticism? Well, I must say that we are not representative of the um, uh, government uh, only. Uh, as negotiation team, um, uh, we are representing the state, um, which includes, of course, the government, but then the political parties. Uh, when the negotiation team was established, there was a huge um, you know, round of consultations, consensus among the political community of Afghanistan, women groups, civil society um, uh, organizations. As a result of all that consultation, the 21 members were kind of chosen to be member of this negotiation team. We, so we are not only representative of the government or the establishment, but we are representative of the state, uh, di representing different political group and different political views. And in fact, this is one of the most diverse group, but yet widely accepted in Afghan society. Um, uh, we have uh, continuously have uh, consultations with um, people from all, all walks of lives, political community, civil society, victims of war, women group to make sure that their voices are included. Um, of course, the pandemic made it difficult to travel to more uh, provinces and get the people's view. But I must say that most of the negotiation members are actually victims of war themselves. Either they have lost their members of family, uh, they have lost, uh, I was personally attacked so many times. So we uh, represent the, the sorrows, the pains, um, and the situation in the past uh, four, four decades of war. We are, most of us are actually born during war, grew up in the war. We represent what Afghanistan after, you know, four decades of war is. And, uh, and most of us actually also represent uh, the past 20 years, uh, the transformed Afghanistan. So this is one of the, while the situation in Afghanistan politically is very fragmented, we all know that. Um, uh, there are not political consensus, um, which I hope uh, soon we will. Uh, but um, this is one of the entities, the negotiation team is one of those uh, political institutions which there is a, a, a cross-Afghanistan um, uh, you know, uh, trust and consensus. Now, of course, uh, the trust uh, could have been used more uh, in a better way if uh, we had um, some success in the negotiation in terms of ceasefire, in terms of making the impact on people's life. This is something we have been saying, I have been saying, our negotiation team has been saying since we started the negotiation in September to um, agree on a ceasefire. But uh, it's such a difficult subject. And of course, we know that the war in Afghanistan has multi-dimension. It's not only a civil war that the two sides set and agree on things. A lot of people actually see their benefit in war, unfortunately. Well, a recent series of targeted assassinations of civil society figures, journalists, academics, and students has terrorized the country. To what extent have these killings impacted public opinion about the Afghan government and the peace process? Uh, people really have um, little trust, I must say, over um, the you know, uh, political settlement. Um, uh, uh, people know that a lot of uh, uh, warring groups um, prefer the military strategy, especially after the, the, the U.S. announcement of uh, its troops uh, pull out without any conditions. Um, people uh, already start thinking about, you know, leaving Afghanistan, brain drain. Um, and it makes it much more difficult for people to see that these targeted assassinations actually become a no one's responsibility uh, game because uh, neither the government do a thorough investigation 
and come to the public that who is behind this, announce to the people who has done this. And neither the Taliban actually have taken responsibility. So it becomes very difficult to see a culture of uh, impunity and less accountability when it comes to the public. And that's why in the negotiation table, we have been emphasizing on agreeing to a ceasefire because in many uh, conflicts uh, that the conflict parties try to um, you know, gain more in the battlefield in order to gain more also in the negotiation table. Here, I think if we really speed up in the negotiation table, we will then save some lives in the battlefield um, because we have already been in war for four decades, active war. So a lot of people have lost uh, lives and those who are alive lost patience. So therefore, I think it's time for us and for the Taliban to agree on a ceasefire, which will then lead to a political uh, power sharing agreement, which is inclusive and acceptable. I think that's the best, uh, best scenario we could uh, use possibly in the remaining time before a complete withdrawal. You are one of four women negotiators from the government team. Can you discuss your priorities? What are your red lines with the Taliban and candidly with your own negotiating team? Um, well, this negotiation between Taliban and the uh, state or the Afghan government, a main part of its uh, focus is actually about women's rights because we know that the Taliban um, demonstrate, demonstrated their extreme uh, policies when they were in power towards women. Uh, women were deprived of their basic rights and uh, we all know what happened to them during Taliban government. So women in Afghanistan have valid concerns uh, and questions about uh, this process. And therefore, for us, um, uh, of course, the priority is, is to preserve and protect women's rights and human rights. But uh, also, uh, we have common issues. Like many other politicians, we no do not only limit ourselves to protecting of women's rights and human rights, because I believe if we protect, if we are able to uh, create um, a political situation, a negotiated settlement where um, uh, you know, um, Taliban or one part of that, the Afghan state and politicians and women uh, group and women politicians are the other part of that, academia, an inclusive, basically an inclusive um, negotiated settlement, women rights will automatically be safeguarded. I think there is an interconnectivity between uh, women rights and democracy in Afghanistan. But of course, there are certain uh, rights of women that we believe will be at risk and, and we not need an, uh, uh, support uh, lo um, from Afghan uh, you know, public um, to defend that, but also above all from international friends, like women political participation. We have a quota in the constitution according to which 25% women are now members of parliament. Women can run regardless of um, their you know, age or, or uh, gender in any position. Um, in the government, including uh, a president. These are the things that I think Taliban have strong views. Education for girls, uh, I mean, uh, co-education is something that uh, actually exists in uh, Afghanistan universities, like many other Muslim countries, for instance, like, uh, you know, Qatar, like um, our uh, um, re uh, neighboring countries. Uh, girls and boys in Afghanistan continue as a co-education uh, in their higher education in universities. These are the things that I think Moving forward, there will be a debate about them. We hope that um, we will have the support of um, other Muslim nations in the region, far region, because um, these practices are now common practices in the rest of the, uh, the Muslim world to uh, have women in the higher senior leadership positions, uh, have women access to resources, have women access to education. These are, I think, now common principle agreed uh, principal values in across Muslim world and across the, the, the world. So I think Taliban need to also adopt themselves based on what is going on in the rest of uh, the world, especially the Muslim communities. It was reported after a previous meeting uh, in Doha that women representatives were handed swag bags from the Taliban. Was this a sincere gesture of goodwill or part of a disingenuous charm offensive? How receptive are the Taliban negotiators to your demands? Um, I, during negotiations, really, I have not come across a, a situation or moment where I see uh, that um, I am miss, uh, that there is a misbehavior with me because of my gender. I have uh, been in the negotiation room for six months, above six months, and um, I have uh, always seen uh, an attitude which uh, 
indicates that I represent Afghanistan and um, you know, the, the, the new generation that transformed a part of Afghanistan. And we do not only limit um, our discussions to women rights or human rights, but also about security, economic affairs, you know, everything that Afghanistan people um, are interested in, the future of the country matters for. So I personally, I have not gone to an experience which, um, uh, of course, uh, as a woman uh, living in Afghanistan, um, we have different layers of struggle. Uh, and it's not only limited to the negotiation table. I mean, there are people who believe like Taliban in, in uh, the Afghan institution parliament. I have been in the parliament for 15 years and I have faced all these views and I have confronted them. When I was tabling laws, I had the same behavior, same views about some members of parliament. But the only difference was that with them, we were using, uh, at the end of the day, cards which uh, demonstrated equal power. I was using my card and they, are, they were using their cards. The, the difference is with, uh, with the Taliban that they are using their military extremists through um, their views, they're pursuing their views through weapon. So um, we need to really bring them to the level where we can use logic cards instead of uh, weapons. Uh, I have not been uh, really facing an extreme situation while at every stage of um, our life as women in Afghanistan, along with my sisters, have been, of course, filled with struggles, uh, little things. Uh, the moment you want to be included is not enough. Inclusion is one aspect of women's rights. But I think to be in the negotiation, to be in the table, to impact, to be part of the decision is another level of uh, women's empowerment. Now, I want to go back to something you said earlier. Um, we often hear that Afghanistan is no longer the Afghanistan of 2001, that there are women in leading positions in academia, government, media, and there are successful women entrepreneurs, as you said, social media influencers. Is this widespread across the country, or is this confined to the big cities while the picture is different in rural areas? Um, uh, when I... When I call uh, Afghanistan as a transformed uh, nation or country, uh, I mean, uh, this is across Afghanistan. Now, probably people who are living in the cities, um, they have more access to resources, not only women, but men also. They have more access to, uh, you know, the decision-making uh, institutions. But I think that transformation is across Afghanistan. For instance, I will just give you an example. My father was, as a member of parliament, he was the first to establish a school girl in our village. But he, will never, uh, he never actually allowed his own daughters to go to school. I went to school when, of course, after my father was killed, I was a very little girl. So when he was killed, we had to flee the village and come to the city. Four years later, I then went to school. I don't know if my father was alive still, he would allow me to, um, to go to school. I'm not sure. but from the same community, from the same village, from the same area. When I ran for parliament, there was no educated uh, girl. Now I think there are around 50 uh, female teachers from the same community, male colleague, I mean male um, uh, citizens of the, that, that village come to me asking for school girls for their, for their girls. That is a transformation. Probably those girls will not uh, look the same as, as I look or my daughters or other girls in the cities. But their demand is the same. If you go to Kandahar, women do not wear the same clothes as I do, but they want their girls to go to school. They want their girls to have a, a, a future. And I think that is, uh, that's a transformed Afghanistan. That being said, I must say that still there is discrepancy between life in the cities and life in the villages. And that is, uh, that is uh, not only about what uh, women want or women demands, that's about everything, development projects, you know, employment opportunities other uh, opportunities. And I think that's the nature of uh, least developed countries. Now, U.S. President Joe Biden has pledged to continue support for Afghan women and girls by maintaining significant humanitarian and development assistance. How reassuring is this for you? Is this enough? It is not enough, Tanya. It's not enough. Unfortunately, the international community actually uh, have kind of um, decided to leave their uh, long-term ally and partner, which was the woman of Afghanistan, um, since they came to Afghanistan um, uh, in the midst of nowhere uh, when they decided to leave. Because uh, you, you remember, you were in Afghanistan. We all remember when uh, the U.S. Um, you know when the U.S. was attacked in 11 September, and the international community decided to come to Afghanistan based on Security Council resolution. 
uh, women uh, were then freed from those confinement, basically, from their homes to go to school, to go to um, uh, universities, to go to work, uh, uh, to run for offices. Um, and the international community was reporting this as their uh, major achievement, while I believe actually this was the achievement of women of Afghanistan that go back to their resilience, to their strength, to their passion. Yes, international community supported, paved the way for these um, moment, moments to be used, but actually the whole credit goes to the women of Afghanistan. Now, after 20 years, without any condition they want to leave, uh, of course, it's uh, it, uh, for a lot of women in Afghanistan, they question this and they feel that they are betrayed with. But um, uh, uh, now moving forward, I think we have to really um, see how we can use the political support. There should be more financial commitment, especially to the women uh, focused institutions and organizations. There should be more uh, funding for girls' education because the country's future and now actually depend on how uh, women and, and younger men could be educated. So financial, political commitment, um, and keeping an eye um, on the negotiation as we move forward to ensure that women's rights are protected are important as in, um, essentials. There's, there's been a lot of talk over the last few months that the Taliban are not the same Taliban. You've been uh, at the table with the Taliban since September 2020. Is that the feeling you get? Have they become more amenable to uh, women's rights? Are they uh, the so-called Taliban 2.0? Uh, have, you, have you been convinced of that? Well, we are actually kind of dealing with two uh, groups of Taliban. One is those who are in Doha. We are talking with them. Um, they're part of the negotiation. They have, of course, been explored to many uh, you know, world opportunities when it comes to women's rights and human rights. Um, but those who are actually fighting on the ground, um, they have not really demonstrated that they have changed. And that is my concern. Probably we will get to an agreement with those who are in negotiation table, but how to get that agreement uh, being implemented and respected across Afghanistan where it's controlled by Taliban. Um, uh, and how do we ensure that those who are actually fighting on the ground will respect these um, uh, the, these values of human rights, uh, girls' education, uh, women's liberty and freedom, because we still receive footages and reports from those areas that are controlled by Taliban that uh, their foot soldiers actually continue to, um, uh, to oppress women, to be brutal against women. Um, and this is a concern I have. The world community seems to be on the back foot compared to the Taliban when it comes to strategic communications. Senior Taliban officials publish op-eds in mainstream publications, they appear on television broadcasts, and they maintain an impressive social media presence. Do you think the Afghan government could do a better job shaping the narrative? True. Well, while I'm very happy to see that um, the Taliban are using media and social media, um, some of uh, you know, the elements that they were extremely opposing when they were in power, um, so uh, I'm happy because uh, by using social media, they can be connected with um, the rest of the world and see how Muslim uh, countries in the other parts of the world actually run their governments and even they could have their different political and um, uh, religious ideologies, but they could still coexist and live with each other. Uh, I hope that we come to a situation in Afghanistan one day that uh, we could still have uh, huge differences politically, but could, we, could, we could live in the same society and respect um, the coexistence and diversity. Uh, in terms of Afghanistan strategic communication, I fully agree with you. Uh, we, have, uh, we have not been able, able to really uh, demonstrate a narrative that people of Afghanistan have been uh, striving for and have been losing lives um, on a daily basis. A lot of people are being killed for those uh, principles and values uh, that they want to live, that they want to live with liberties, with uh, respect in, a, in an Afghanistan which is in peace with itself and in peace with the region and with the world. That narrative really has to be further introduced and uh, promoted. I fully agree that we need to do a better job when it comes to you know, communication and delivering our messages. Although, I mean, uh, there is an unannounced and natural uh, consensus over these values in Afghanistan. 
and that is not limited to the cities. It's also in the villages, in the in the in the, in the remote areas. People believe uh, that there is a natural consensus that they want to work towards a prosperous, free, uh, liberal Afghanistan. But that uh, desire of people and their strife have not really been fully communicated and narrated to the world. Finally, what does Afghan society look like in five years, in your view? Um, in a positive scenario, I hope uh, in five years, uh, or even less, in, in five months, we agree on a political settlement, and uh, we uh, silence the guns, and we work for a social peace building, because not only a political peace building, peace is important, but also a social acceptance and coexistence is important. Uh, where everybody um, live in a country which is uh, so beautiful, full of natural resources, a very young nation, um, you know, a hardworking nation. These are all the potentials that we could use. Of course, there is a negative scenario as well. If we do not really agree on a, a political settlement uh, and power sharing arrangement and silence the guns and work for a, you know, a peaceful Afghanistan, then the situation could go to chaos where war will deteriorate more lives lost, and um, Afghanistan, once again, could be used as a safe haven for those military extremist groups. I hope um, we will not go to the second scenario, and we all put our hands and efforts uh, to uh, support an Afghanistan which will stand on its own feet and be prosperous and peaceful and stable. Fauzia, this has been a great conversation. Afghanistan at a crossroads. Thank you for your time.